Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Connecticut's Old State House. My name is Rebecca Tabor Conover. I'm head of public programs here. I'm delighted to welcome you here for our conversation on at noon um, called Leslie Parish, Refugee Resettlement in Connecticut. I think it's going to be a very interesting program today. Um, I did want to thank our funders, Connecticut Humanities, who are funding this um, program series. We really appreciate it. And we're really happy to have all of you here today. Um, many of you are regulars, and I would invite you, each of you have received a survey. We truly do read the surveys, and if um, we would appreciate your feedback or ideas for upcoming programs. Um, it's almost summer. We've survived another uh, New England winter, and this June we will uh, kick off our annual um, farmer's market on June the 13th, and also we're having our uh, concert series. Uh, throughout the summer. The first one is on June the 30th at noon. It's the um, locomotive uh, steam group, which will be a lot of fun. Without further ado, um, it is my pleasure to introduce my colleague and friend from the Connecticut Network, Diane Smith. Thank you. 11 million Syrians have fled their homes since the Civil War broke out in 2011. Nearly 5 million have gone to other Mideastern countries, a million more have applied for asylum in Europe, and the Obama administration agreed to take in more than 100,000 Syrians in fiscal year 2017. But shortly after President Trump was inaugurated, he issued two executive orders designed to shut down the flow of refugees, at least for several months. That sparked demonstrations at airports across the country and a debate over whether we should be welcoming refugees to our communities. Of course, this is not the first time that the Syrians have faced terror in the face of war. Our speaker today is going to tell us about the impact of World War I a century ago on communities in the Middle East who, in her words, experienced widespread displacement due to forced relocation, mass migration, and targeted massacres. Greater Syria suffered from widespread famine and human catastrophe. Today we'll hear about how Americans, and specifically Connecticut, made efforts to alleviate that crisis 100 years ago, and then we'll have a panel discussion about Connecticut's interactions with refugees today. Our speaker right now is Amy Fias. She is a graduate student at Yale University. She specializes in the history of the modern Middle East. Amy has published on Arab communities in North America, humanitarian history in the Middle East, and the Arab Spring of 2011. In addition to her academic career, Amy Fias has worked for museums and public history institutions across Connecticut from 2012 through 2016. Please welcome Amy Fias. I'd like to start off by thanking Rebecca, Diane, uh, and the Connecticut State House for inviting me uh, to present uh, for this monthly uh, lecture series. Relatedly, I would also like to thank two individuals, Christine Pitsley and her colleague, Christine Gavreau, both affiliated with the Connecticut State Library, uh, who provided me with the inspiration to undertake the projects that this lecture is based on. I usually start off my presentations on this topic with a lesser known poem by renowned Lebanese poet Khalil Gibran. The following is a brief excerpt from Dead Are My People. Dead are my people, gone are my people, but I exist yet, lamenting them in my solitude. Dead are my friends, and in their death my life is not but great disaster. The knolls of my country are submerged by tears and blood, for my people and my beloved are gone. My people and your people, my Syrian brother, are dead. What can be done for those who are dying? Our lamentations will not satisfy their hunger, and our tears will not quench their thirst. What can we do to save them between the iron paws of hunger? The Great War was a particularly traumatic episode for communities across the Middle East, who in addition to suffering military casualties of the conflict, also experienced widespread famine and human catastrophe. These heartbreaking lines penned by Khalil Gibran speak to this latter aspect of the war, and in particular, the Great Famine that ravaged Greater Syria between 1915 and 1918. Environmental factors, including a severe drought, devastated conditions across the region that would, contribute, that would continue to deteriorate 
as wartime policies took root. When the Ottoman Empire officially entered the theater of combat during the fall of 1914, the Allies responded by implementing a blockade that prevented sustenance from reaching Ottoman lands. This added to the strained resources of farmers overtaxed by the empire, resulting in severe food shortages and ultimately famine. Over 500,000 in the Eastern Mediterranean perished in this Holocaust. Mount Lebanon alone lost 20% of its inhabitants to mass starvation and disease. This tragedy represents but one of many devastating events and conditions civilians in the Middle East endured during this period. As the social fabric of the Ottoman system began to unravel, ethnic tensions rose to the fore and intracommunal violence launched the region into civil conflict. Animosities between ethnic and religious minorities across Ottoman and Persian domains would pit Assyrians, Armenians, Greeks against Kurds and other local tribes. Perceived disloyalty to an empire that had managed these territories for upwards of 200 years would result in forced deportations, targeted executions, and population transfers by Ottoman agents. For the Middle East, the Great War would culminate in the demise of an empire, the displacement of millions, and the restructuring of the political map whose legacies continue to reverberate into the present day. My brief talk today highlights American efforts to alleviate this humanitarian crisis and focuses on the operations of the Near East Relief, the first large-scale philanthropic project in response to the plight of the Armenians, Assyrians, and Greeks. From 1915 to 1930, the NEF is credited with raising over $116 million of aid and saving the lives of over 1 million, including 132,000 orphans. Over a hundred years later, as we continue to hear the echoes of Gibran's lamentation over the land and the people of the Middle East, perhaps the protagonists and the undertakings of the Near East Relief can provide us with inspiration. Given the current refugee crisis in the region, perhaps we can learn from our predecessors, address our own past mistakes, and contribute to forging a more peaceful future. The American Committee for Armenian and Syrian Relief was formed in 1915 at the behest of American ambassador to the Ottoman Empire, Henry Morgenthau, in response to the deportations and atrocities committed first against the Armenians and then against the Assyrians and Greeks across Anatolia and its frontiers during World War I. While for centuries the Ottoman Empire fostered a multi-ethnic and religiously diverse domain, the advent of the Young Turk government and the influence of European nationalism would lead to an assertive Ottoman response to ethnic and religious minorities suspected of disloyalty. On May 27, 1915, the Ottoman parliament passed the Tehsir law, legislation that authorized the removal of the Armenian population and would provide a justification for state policies of extermination. The terror that befell the Armenian community under threat of extinction was the motor that propelled American humanitarians to act. In conjunction with Ambassador Morgenthau, philanthropist Cleveland Dodge, and missionary James Barton jointly created the ACASR to provide emergency humanitarian aid to the Armenians and other minority populations in the empire. The organization briefly operated under the Armenian Committee for Near East Relief in 1918, and then as the Near East Relief after being chartered by Congress in 1919. From 1915 to 1919, the committee would embark on an ambitious and successful nationwide campaign to mobilize the American public toward unprecedented grassroots support of humanitarian efforts in the Near East. The first donations primarily consisted of internal funding from the committee, and a sum of 100,000 was wired to Morgenthau for distribution on October of 1915. While fundraising began as an internal endeavor, the ACASR would soon develop a network of local committees throughout the country that would conduct their own fundraising efforts, usually in coordination with national campaigns, that would be sent back to the committee. By June of 1916, 38 local committees across 16 states had become a part of this local national dynamic. These efforts were primarily designed to raise funds for direct relief abroad, that is, to distribute monies, specialists, and material resources to the committee's network of partners, including missionaries, diplomats, and private organizations with long-standing histories of working with these populations affected by the crisis. 
These funds would help to transform mission sta stations into hospitals and orphanages. It would also purchase much needed supplies and sustenance. The ACASR also sent specialists, such as medical professionals, to staff primarily missions-based institutions with experienced personnel. While early talks did touch on bringing displaced persons to the United States, immigration laws passed during wartime prevented any concerted effort toward this aim. This map gives us a glimpse into how the relief ecosystem worked, where these funds were collected, centralized through their headquarters in New York, and distributed to their stations across the Near East. Because of the diversity of the regions, the people affected, the organizational structures of those administering relief, the work was manifested differently, differently in each location. In regions like Persia and Syria, men, women, and children, after being brought into the realm of safety and being treated for any malnourishment or disease, would engage in a variety of enterprises to support their transitional community. Refugees would cobble, knit, and weave, among many other activities, to help sustain the institutions. In places like Alexandropol, also known as the Orphan City, the primarily young population would be expected to study and support the maintenance of the grounds. This city, now known as Grumi in a part of Armenia, was the home to the largest orphanage of the Near East Relief that at its height housed 22,000 orphans. Part of the Near East Relief's success was related to the strategies they used to engage the American public. Art, film, posters, celebrities were all employed to transform the nation into a country of citizen philanthropists. Creative campaigns, such as the famous Commission Near East Relief posters that you'll see up on the screen, as well as films such as Alice in Hungerland, tugged at the heartstrings of Americans that would in turn give generously long after the US had formally entered the war in 1917. By 1930, the Near East Relief is credited with raising over $116 million the equivalent to around $2 billion today. In terms of alleviating human suffering, it is said that the NER saved over 1 million lives, including the 132 orphan children that I mentioned previously. Now for the Connecticut context. So Connecticut's contribution to the National Relief Campaign was significant in comparison to the state's size and resources. The state produced one of the highest per capita rates of donation including more than 628,000 for ACASR between 1915 and 1921. The noteworthy efforts of Connecticut residents were acknowledged in a letter from the Committee in Constantinople published in the Bridgeport Times on October 5, 1920, exclaiming, quote, how you would have rejoiced to see the fruits of your labor in Connecticut as I have seen them in Armenia, end quote. In addition to financial support, Connecticut residents also answered the call to serve in war-ravaged regions of the Ottoman Empire. Approximately 69 volunteers went abroad to aid orphans, refugees, and displaced persons in the Levant, Greece, Turkey, and Armenia. One notable worker was Christopher Thurber, a Norwich native who oversaw the transfer of over 7,000 children to safety following the Great Fire of Smyrna in 1922. Thurber's extensive humanitarian work in the region would eventually lead to his position as the director of the Near East Relief in Greece. Back on the home front, Connecticut residents are also reported to have adopted Armenian orphans. The details and specifics surrounding these arrangements remains unclear, but from selections from the Connecticut press, we know that specific fundraisers were held particularly by charitable organizations to underwrite the costs associated with adopting Armenian children. While recognizing the valiant work of the Near East Relief, we must also pay attention to some of the problematic rhetoric used to rally public support. The language employed to motivate communities and individuals in Connecticut to action was often infused with religious appeals and civilizational stereotypes. During the Near East Relief's Christmas appeal of 1922, Connecticut Governor Marcus Holcomb petitioned the state to give and support orphans in, quote, biblical lands, end quote. In the Norwich Bulletin, Connecticut's NER field secretary, Reverend Henry Hurlbert, recounted his experiences in the Near East and the, quote, barbarous acts of the Turks, end quote. Even a casual reading of the American press during this period will reveal that the Near East Relief appealed 
to anti-Muslim sentiment and long-standing fears of the Ottoman presence in Central Europe to stimulate support for the cause. The platform appealed to America's religious duty to protect persecuted Christians. Certain calls to action read, quote, did you know that a quarter of a million homeless children, many of them orphaned because their fathers or mothers refused to denounce the Christian faith, are dependent for life itself upon American philanthropy, end quote. But what often isn't mentioned in the press of the period is that those affiliated with the NEF also served Muslim populations and often liaised with them to ensure the safety and protection of minorities in the empire. Such was the case in Persia, where missionary turned U.S. counsel William Shedd leveraged his support with the Kurds during certain high tense situations to prevent hostilities from arising between those tribes and the Assyrian community of Orumia. Several of his colleagues even mentioned in their correspondences how they would serve the destitute Shia Muslims of the Qajar domain as they had also been left vulnerable by a weak central government. There's even instances that mention how they administered aid at the mosques. The complicated and entangled histories between this multi-confessional milieu is an aspect that we need to recognize. That the animosities between Muslim and Christian, Armenians, Kurds, and Turks were exacerbated by a global conflict and cannot be reduced to, quote, ancient hatreds or civilizational clashes, end quote. Despite the heroic efforts of the NER, following the end of the war, several exclusionary policies would dominate American politics. The Immigration Act of 1924, also known as the Johnson-Reed Act, introduced a quota-based system for migrants to settle in the US. This system essentially outlawed Asian, Arab, and Eastern European immigrants and was designed to, quote, preserve American homogeneity, end quote. These restrictive measures in many ways provide us with antecedents of fear and misinformation that we continue to see play out in the politics of our present day. If only this period was a continuation of the compassion and concern for the suffering of those in distant lands that categorized the Near East Relief's operations during World War I. In considering the undertaking of American humanitarianists during this period, and the agency of refugees who were the recipients of their help, the underlying question I'd like to pose is, how do we talk about refugees? How do we see them? How do we depict them? I was happy to discover that the visual archive of the Near East Relief contains images of men, women, and children doing both ordinary and extraordinary human things. They were baking bread in Aleppo. They were making these beautiful tapestries in Syria. There are pictures of children in school, of women sewing, of men gardening. It reminds us that refugees are not numbers, they're not casualties, they're not statistics. They're not perpetually huddled in blankets, in line for food rations, or living in makeshift tents. They are mothers, fathers, daughters, and sons. They're farmers, factory workers, and small business owners. They are invaluable contributions to the societies they inhabit and wouldn't even be refugees in the first place were it not for the persecution that befell them. Due to no fault of their own, they have been dispossessed of their property and their livelihoods. We continue to dispossess them if we speak of them as less than human. How we talk about refugees is important. It's important to be reminded that where matters different, we could be in their place. Encountering that reality and embracing human dignity is of the utmost importance and should form the basis of how we engage with these individuals and how we speak of their experiences when they cannot speak for themselves, which is often the case of the historian. While it should be noted that the NER often used problematic language, it also represented a time when there was an impressive and early example of a nationwide campaign to alleviate the suffering of the globe's most vulnerable people. I hope that the stories and the protagonists of the Near East Relief during World War I have impressed that imperative upon us and inspired us to fight for real solutions in our present time. Thank you. Could our panelists come up and join us, please? Amy, that was wonderful.
And um, I did have an experience many years ago when I was a reporter at uh, WTNH TV of covering a um, service that was being held in memory of the Armenian genocide. And I did meet some people who said that they were the children of those orphans who'd been adopted here in Connecticut. So I, I do know that they did come here. So I'd like to introduce our panel, and I'd also like to tell you, if you haven't been with us before, that we very much encourage you to ask questions or make comments. Um, if you'd like to do so, please raise your hand so that I get my attention, and then uh, Bill will come to you with a microphone. And even if you speak loudly, we do need the microphone because we're recording this for television. So um, you already know Amy. Seated beside Amy is Chris George. For 11 years, Chris has been the executive director of IRIS, Integrated Refugee and Immigration Services, which is the New Haven-based refugee set resettlement agency that welcomed more than 500 refugees to Connecticut last year. Chris has spent most of his professional life living in or working on the Middle East, including seven years in the West Bank and the Gaza Strip. Chris was the executive director of Human Rights Watch Middle East and worked with Save the Children, mostly in the West Bank and Gaza. Chris began his international career in 1977 as a Peace Corps volunteer in Oman. Altogether, he spent more than 16 years living in the Middle East, and he speaks Arabic. Nancy Cadigan serves as Education and Career Transition Specialist of Adult Learning at Hartford Public Library. In this role, Ms. Cadigan is responsible for assisting adult learning students in making a successful transition to post-secondary education, training, or the workforce. She also oversees selection, training, and matching of volunteers who tutor and mentor adult learners, and we will tell you a little bit about how you can get involved if you'd like to do that. Prior to joining Hartford Public Library, Nancy was an ESL program director at Capital Community College for 20 years. She has an MS in student development in higher education and is a Connecticut licensed professional counselor. So thank you for being with us. Chris, I'd like to start with you and ask you, um, how about a definition? What is a refugee, and how many are estimated to be in the world today? Good question. Um, and as I give you the definition, think of how it is um, more specific than that broader category of immigrants. An immigrant is anyone who comes to the United States from another country. The international law definition of a refugee is a person who was forced to flee their home country, so they've crossed an international border to get this status, They've been forced to flee their home country because of persecution. Either they have been persecuted or they have a well-founded fear for persecution because of their race, their religion, their nationality, their political opinion, or the social group they happen to be in. And of course, war is perhaps the greatest mechanism of persecution. There are 21 million refugees in the world today. Compare that to the population of Connecticut, 3.5 million. 21 million refugees in the world today, and the largest piece of that 21 million um, are the Syrian refugees. There are 5 million Syrian refugees um, who've been forced to flee Syria. Most are in Turkey, Lebanon, and Jordan. Chris, uh, tell us a little bit about what IRIS does uh, for people who come here. Well, you've got these 21 million refugees all over the world, Middle East, Africa, parts of Asia. Um, most refugees have a life of waiting years, 5, 10, 15, 20 years, in refugee camps or outside urban areas. But a tiny fraction of refugees are given an opportunity to resettle in another country, um, less than... Uh, Oh, much less than 1% of the total number of refugees. The US government has a refugee resettlement program, which most of us learned about just two years ago when refugees were suddenly in the news. Um, for many years, the US government has invited refugees after they've been interviewed, selected, and go through an extreme vetting process overseas. They're then invited to come to the United States and get on track to become citizens. Refugee resettlement is what we call it. And the US has had the largest refugee resettlement program historically uh, in the world. We used to bring more refugees to the United States than all of the other countries with refugee resettlement programs put together. 
2015, it was um, 75,000 refugees. That was bumped up to 85,000 in 2016. And um, as you mentioned in your opening remarks, the President of the United States at the United Nations in September, October of 2016 promised the world, promised the international community that the United States would bring 110,000 refugees in 2017 to the United States. He made a promise to the world, he made a promise to those 110,000 refugees. Our current president is reneging on that promise through his executive orders. He is trying to reduce the number to just 50,000 and uh, suspend the entire refugee program for four months. Fortunately, we have an independent judiciary in this country and the executive orders have really only been in effect for a matter of days. Refugees have been coming. They've continued to come. Connecticut has been welcoming hundreds of refugees. Connecticut has been amazingly generous and welcoming. And I always refer to the philanthropic history of Connecticut, and I was so glad to see that slide in Amy's presentation. Now I've got a specific example of how far back Connecticut's hospitality, its compassion for refugees, just goes. And it begins to explain why they have stepped forward over the past couple of years. And it has really opened the eyes of the entire country. More community groups have come forward to welcome refugees into their neighborhoods. More community groups in Connecticut have stepped forward to welcome refugees than in any other state. It's just remarkable. So if you're from Connecticut, you should be feeling very proud. Uh, we should also um, remind people that at one point uh, a couple of years ago, there was a Syrian family that was destined to go to Indiana, and the governor at the time, Mike Pence, who's now the vice president, determined that he was uncomfortable having them move there because of his security concerns, and Governor Malloy stepped in and invited them to come to Connecticut. So that's one of the families We, we welcome here. them here with, with open arms. So what do we do? What does a refugee resettlement agency do? Well, there are 350 refugee resettlement agencies in the United States spread across the country. All of those 350 nonprofits, some small, some medium, they are under the supervision of nine national voluntary agencies, and those work under the supervision of the State Department. So you see, it is a wonderful public-private partnership welcoming refugees. After refugees are selected and vetted overseas, they're then assigned to a refugee resettlement agency. We get an email that says, family of six from Aleppo, Syria, is coming in two weeks. This is happening all across the country right now as I speak. There are emails coming to refugee agencies saying, family of six from the Congo, family of five from Iraq, family of four from Sudan. We have two weeks to go out, find an apartment, furnish it with donated furniture, and when these chairs are used and you want to get rid of them, <laughs> donate them to Iris, please. And um, so we stock the kitchen with about four days' worth of food with the help of wonderful volunteers. I have a feeling some of the people in the audience have volunteered Perhaps. to help set up apartments. Yes. We then have to find someone in the neighborhood who can cook a culturally appropriate hot meal. If it's a Syrian family, a Syrian dish. A Congolese family, Congolese meal. A culturally appropriate hot meal to serve this family within two hours of their arrival. That, my friends, is a U.S. government requirement maybe the best U.S. Mm. government requirement of all time. Mm. We get all this ready. The family arrives at the airport. They're met at the, uh, at the airport by someone from the U.N. They put them on a minivan. They zip up 95. We meet them in New Haven. It's late at night. It's cold. It's windy. We bundle them up in donated uh, coats, take them to their apartment. They have a culturally appropriate hot meal, a good night's sleep. We bring them into the office the next day. We sit them down, and we say, okay, here's the program. It's not going to be a walk in the park. You already know this because you had to pay your way to get here. Mm -hmm. Refugees take out loans to cover the airfare to come to the United States. We don't lavish a lot of assistance on the refugee resettlement program. We're going to connect you to health care. We're going to enroll your children in school. We're going to help you learn English. And we're going to help you find a job. And we're going to do this as quickly as possible because we don't have that much time. We don't have that much money. But it works. Before you know it, the kids are learning English better than their parents. 
they're learning English, the parents are learning English, they're getting jobs, they're becoming self-sufficient, they're becoming independent, they're all on track to get green cards, they become US citizens after five years. They make this country strong, they make it proud. This is the Statue of Liberty in action. Mm -hmm. Why would anyone want to mess with this program? We can talk about that later. Yeah. Uh, Chris, I should tell you that recently I saw on Facebook a friend of mine who had just moved was looking to get rid of a bunch of furniture. And she said, very good condition, dining room table and chairs, bed, this, that. And she said, anybody who wants to come and get it, come pick it up. I said, call this agency. Tell them what you have and see if you can give it to them because your friends who might need a dining room table don't need it as much as a family who's coming in with nothing but the clothes on their back and one small knapsack. So hopefully she did that. Um, I didn't follow Thank up. Thank you. I didn't want to be a pest, but I did make it pretty clear. Nancy, tell us how the Hartford Public Library, how and why the library got so involved in helping immigrants and refugees. Well, I, I think uh, back in 2000, the person whose shoes I'm trying to fill today, Homo uh, was hired by the library to create programs and programming for the growing immigrant and refugee population of Hartford. So it's now 17 years old. So it's quite, it's called the American Place. It's, it's within the learning center of the Hartford Public Library. And we work with Catholic Charities because Iris, I wish Iris were closer, uh, which is an excellent agency. We work with Catholic Charities we work with many uh, public sector agencies, really recruiting and working with folks in a number of ways. And our capacities include trying to help people with English as a second language, citizenship instruction, filling out the application for citizenship, which is 21 pages and daunting. Um, we have a grant from USCIS, which allows us to offer those services for free because the belief is to become a citizen also makes you closer and feel more welcome in the United States. The driver of our program really is to integrate and uh, to integrate the folks that are coming in and making them feel welcome and to try to accelerate that integration by finding ways to make people come together. People from the receiving community often volunteer with our folks at the library and they help them with a number of ways of adjusting to society. They may be tutors, they may be advocates, but what they're doing is they're bringing their expertise and their networks and mobilizing those networks on behalf of those we serve. We are seeing some Syrians and uh, some uh, church coalitions are also adapting families and we are also seeing people from, from Burma, Nepal, all over the world that have settled in Hartford. And so our, our really our mission is to help them feel welcome. And our motto really is we belong here. And we work affirming that we belong here motto all the time. So I definitely say ditto to what you've just said, Chris. These are folks who bring talent, skills, unbelievable strength to our, to our uh, region. So we're proud to work with them. Nancy, why such a commitment from the library? You know, we think about, um, I get emails from the library all the time asking for donations for a whole variety of programs, including some of the more traditional things that libraries have done about books and reading. And why such a big commitment to this kind of a, a, of a program? I think that the diversity of Hartford is growing all the time. It certainly started out some decades ago with many Latinos arriving, and since there have been again, settled refugees, and people, we happen to be next door to USCIS, which is immigration services right across the street. So folks gravitate to come to our building. Mm -hmm. And before the American Place was established, frankly, the library, it, it, it became a, a situation where we had to find a way to reach people in some fashion that would really would make a difference to getting them out to feel part of the society. Certainly the mission of the American Library is democratic, that everyone is equal. We never check if someone's a documented or undocumented person. Um, I would say that the demand drove what we've created. And I like to think that people think of us as a touchstone when they arrive, and word of mouth is probably the best way that we bring people to us. Um, any day of the week you can come over, our hours are 10 to 8 daily, and. We're open on Saturdays and even during some season on Sundays. People come to the family center with their kids. There are all different kinds of services, certainly beyond what we offer in the American Place. Mm -hmm. So it's demand. 
Um, one of the people that um, has worked with you and that the library has, has helped get started here is with us today, uh, George and Annis uh, Kingsley. He is an artist. Um, George, would you stand up, please, so we can give you the microphone? Uh, he came to Connecticut as a refugee from the Ivory Coast. Tell us a little bit about your story, um, why you came here, and what the library has assisted you in doing. Uh, I'm an artist by profession and uh, a teacher teaching uh, at the School of Art in the University of Côte d'Ivoire. And in 2011, because of political problems, I have to leave my country. Uh, I was talking too much. I was having a show in a radio station, so I was talking about what was going on. And we had an election with two presidents elect, like what uh, Al Gore and uh, uh, Bush in America. So we needed Being elected at the same time? Yeah. Two presidents. Two okay. presidents. This one say I won, the other one say I won. So we were, we were to decide how to, to solve that problem. And uh, one say that we have to recount the ballot vote to see who won. And uh, the other person say no, I won, I won. And it was supported by a power. Mm -hmm. I don't want to talk about this town. It was supported by a power. And the power financed a rebellion mm -hmm. in another country and they came through other country to attack the government's uh, army. So we intellectual, we start, start talking a lot about it. So there was a time that uh, they were able to infiltrate all the big cities and trying to kill people who were talking about that aspect. And uh, what was bad it was that even UN, even UN agreed to vote a lot to bomb the president of that country that moment, even you. That means it was the French government mm -hmm. who sent the document and the American supported it and was passed. Mm -hmm. The only country who said, no, stop, we have to see what is going on, was Russia. Mm -hmm. That was uh, something for us. Mm -hmm. You know, Russia said, no, there's something was going on. Let's see what is going on. Let's and how did this affect you? A lot, because I couldn't anymore stay in my house. I have to hide myself. And uh, hiding myself, I got a uh, I was sick, kidney failure. So I needed to get out of the country to be able to uh, do my dialysis. Mm -hmm. So I have to leave my wife and my child and go to another country. And my wife have to move from the house, mm -hmm. send her somewhere else, you know. And uh, I will have to stay in Ghana for two years where I was able to do my dialysis. Mm -hmm. But my life was mixed up from there, you know, without my family, without anything. It was hard, mm -hmm. it was seriously hard. It took me two years to file the document to UNESCO because I was an artist and I've done a lot of things in West Africa. So UNESCO helped me to file the document. Mm -hmm. And uh, through uh, America, the American government accepted the document. So it took them two years to do the check, the background check, uh, check mm -hmm. and everything. And from that, uh, I was sent to Hartford. But how Hartford? I told them that I just wanted a quiet city not far from a big city. <laughs> a quiet city, not far from a big city, where I can really live my artist life. Mm -hmm. And they sent me to Connecticut. So I came to Connecticut, and uh, it was in 2013. And when I reached here, the first thing I asked the following day, uh, through an agency, Cathy Charity, I asked them, where is the cultural center? Mm -hmm. They say, there's no cultural center, but we have the library where mm -hmm. they do exhibition and everything. Mm -hmm. I said, OK. So the third day I went to the library and I met Nancy there, you know, and from there I showed them what I can be able to do as an artist and everything. So my first job that I got, I think it was two weeks after, is from the library uh -huh. to, to take the, the kids, teach them a little bit of drawing and things like that. And uh, my chance also was that I was living not far from here mm -hmm. in Asalem Hill. So the neighborhood association that uh, Nancy is a part of, took charge of me, really, you know, mm -hmm. to help me integrate the system, mm -hmm. uh, navigate even, and get a better house and everything. And I was able to start teaching in the neighborhood mm -hmm. arts, and I was able to save money to bring my family here also. So my wife and my child are here with right. me. That's wonderful. So really, wonderful. it's true. Yeah. I can say through uh, God's help, you know, and uh, the American government, and uh, here it was uh, the library, and uh, the Asalem Hill Neighborhood Association. And we have a group that we created there. We call them 
welcome committee. Welcome committee is to welcome all the new arrival. It can be Americans who just arrived in that neighborhood or foreigners who have come to that neighborhood. So we come together, you know, we share ideas, we share projects, and we share meals together. So Thank you for uh, telling us your story. It's a wonderful story. Um, <laughs> Amy, when uh, George said about um, uh, you know how his background was checked and how he had to wait for a couple of years, it reflects what Chris said about your life is about waiting. Um, mm -hmm. People, we've heard this term over the last you know couple of years, um, extreme vetting. We need extreme vetting. Isn't that what we already have, or not? Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. And um, you know, I know this firsthand from my experience. I, mean, I work very closely with uh, with Chris and. Um, the amazing work that he does, and for I was actually involved with a um, advocacy organization, advocacy organization in Danbury, and it took a village to be able to um, help these people through because the process is incredibly stringent. It's the most stringent in the world, mm -hmm. um, and this actually has precedence historically as well. Um, a lot of the work that I do is actually also the first wave of Arab immigration mm -hmm. to the United States. And you have these situations in Ellis Island where a lot of families are separated, they're turned away. Mm -hmm. um, and there's really interesting stories of how they try to reunite, but it's, um, it's historically been very difficult to mm -hmm. go through. Mm -hmm. And um, George could, uh, Chris could go into detail mm -hmm. about how long that process takes, but um, you're absolutely right, Diane. It's already at an the most extreme uh, process in the world, and, and they are the most vetted form mm -hmm. of migrant mm -hmm. globally. Mm -hmm. it, uh, to, to attain the refugee status, mm -hmm. it, it's an incredibly difficult mm -hmm. um, process. Mm -hmm. uh, Chris, um, a few months ago, uh, the former FBI director, uh, who was the FBI director at the time, James Comey, uh, testified that there was what he called less than excellent vetting in the past on some Iraqi refugees, including two who were later arrested on terrorism-related charges. He said the screening has improved dramatically since then, but that the data available to check refugees from Syria is not as extensive as the information on Iraq. How would you respond yes, to that? Yes, that's right. Uh, we invaded Iraq and we invaded Afghanistan, took over the government buildings, had access to all the files, and a wealth of information on, on everyone. Mm -hmm. We have not invaded Syria. Uh, we have not taken over the files, uh, government buildings, so we don't have that kind of information. Mm -hmm. Instead, we have to get it through interviews, a long, arduous, uh, invasive, very personal question process, uh, checking information that one refugee gives us against information gathered from other refugees. It takes a year and a half, two years. So it takes longer, it's more difficult, it is a more rigorous process. In the end, more people are probably screened out because we might have some doubt about the accuracy and honesty of their answers. But in the end, the Department of Homeland Security uh, verifies that their vetting process is adequate uh, as Amy said, it's the most rigorous in the world. It is by far the hardest way for anyone outside the United States to get into this country. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if you were a bad dude sipping sweet tea in a cafe in Kabul or Baghdad or Damascus and you wanted to come to the United States to hurt people, you probably would not choose the U.S. government <laughs> refugee resettlement vetting process as the <laughs> avenue. Uh, there are other ways uh, to get here. There must be rigorous, extreme vetting mm -hmm. of people coming to this mm -hmm. country. We all agree security is important. Mm -hmm. We should never be taking chances and bring people here without a vetting process. Mm -hmm. At the same time, I think we all agree the U.S. government has a leadership role to play in helping refugees. It's part of our history part of our DNA to welcome refugees to this country. So there's the dilemma. How do we do it in an age of international terrorism? We have an extreme vetting process that is operated by the Department of Homeland Security. If anyone would like to um, make a remark or ask a question, uh, please raise your hand. I'll bring you the microphone and I'll come to you next. Thinking back to a darker period of refugees, World War II, 
Um, the United States is notorious for refusing uh, Jewish refugees uh, during the Holocaust. And a lot of that came from uh, the shadow of the Immigration Act of 1924, which was very, very restrictive on Eastern European immigrants. So that raised the question now about what, um, what kind of context does federal immigration law set today? How open-minded is Congress today to refugees? Uh, the refugee program today um, does not have those kinds of quotas. Um, instead, the State Department, the State Department's general guideline is they try to select refugees who are the most in need of resettlement, refugees who are the most vulnerable. Perhaps it's a refugee family in a refugee camp um, and there's a single parent, and five little kids, or a family that's got some members who are injured, or maybe they come from a political uh, party where their politics still places them in danger, even though they have fled their home country. Um, and we also focus on families. Um, we try for a variety of refugees from around the world, so we will not bring in 100% of refugees from one country. Um, here in Connecticut, we resettle refugees from Congo, uh, Sudan, Afghanistan, Iraq, Syria, who else, Somalis? Yeah, Any Bhutanese, Burmese? So we try for a variety. Every now and then, um, there is another factor that might rise to the top, which is people who have worked with the U.S. government overseas, and because of their association with the U.S. government, they're being persecuted for that. Mm -hmm. Their lives are in danger, the lives of their family members, they will rise to the top of the list. In fact, we even created a new program for them, very similar to the refugee resettlement programs called the Special Immigrant Visa Program. And many of the Afghan families and Iraqi families who are here in Connecticut came through that program. Some of those people might have been interpreters right. for, interpreters uh, for the, the military. Marines, or, yeah. mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Driving trucks for contractors. Yeah. I think we had another question over here. Ma'am, did you have a question? Did you want to ask a question or make a remark? Given the fact that you were saying that you were had a vetting uh, process and that it was extremely stringent, et cetera, we do know that it did happen before, and I'm bringing 2011 in here. They did not come through the U.S. government refugee resettlement program. Oh, they were homegrown? Who were you talking about? I'm talking about 9-11. Oh, no, yes, they did not come through the refugee program. They came a lot on of people don't student or they were tourist student, visas. Student visas. They were studying. So they came that. in through a, is there anything being done about that? Student yes, visas? Yes, there is a tightening of those other visa processes. And, and yes, they're, they're probably applying some of the refugee resettlement mm -hmm. selection mechanism and p procedures to those other ways of coming to the United States. Nancy, uh, one of the programs that um, the library offers I thought was really interesting because it gives an opportunity for people to volunteer, which is to be a cultural navigator. What exactly does that mean? Uh, I think I had referred a little earlier to them. Um, it really is uh, lending a hand to folks who are new arrivals to help them feel more comfortable and welcome here. And we ask people to volunteer. In fact, there's someone right there today that uh, I've been working with. Um, to make a commitment to work with us at least three months and to work and sit with individuals or families between one to two hours per week. And what we find is as the new arrival person begins to feel more comfortable because often they're speaking to someone at the bank, yes or no, and someone at Stop and Shop, and they're not interacting with people from the receiving community. So the whole idea is to increase their comfort level and their feeling welcome through folks who are volunteering. And I know, of course, you have this, a similar program. So through this, the volunteer efforts, they connect people to jobs, uh, practice for job interviews, prepare for citizenship later on. They keep these relationships and build them really of trust. But our job at the library is also, also to give training to these folks who are coming in because many folks are not that familiar with working with immigrant mm -hmm. refugee mm -hmm. populations. So it's on us to interview, 
train, select, and then monitor those relationships. Most of the work is done at the library mm -hmm. um, where people come in, they have a little private space to work. Um, many times our folks, the, the refugees and immigrants bring food, which is also their way of sharing because often they're living very close to poverty mm -hmm. where they have been in neighborhoods that are very still, I would say, low-income neighborhoods where coming to the library gives them a chance kind of to take a break, mm -hmm. come in, look at books, uh, talk with others, and also the whole idea of them working together with other immigrants and refugees. There's a lot of interaction where it's almost like a support group of folks who work together as they are trying to go out into the world. And many people have to start at those low-level mm -hmm. jobs and trying to have people feel confident as they go out is really our job, but we see that the young children do bring from their schools, they bring in English, it motivates the parents to learn English. Um, many parents are working two or three jobs mm -hmm. around the clock. So I, I think that the cultural navigators bring a spirit to, to service that I think is pretty unique. And um, we're open to anyone who's willing to work with us. Uh, we would appreciate it. Are they, um, can they invite the families to you know an American barbecue on uh, Memorial Day and give them some hamburgers and hot dogs if it, if it doesn't violate their yes. religion or their religious right. beliefs and maybe yeah. an apple pie and uh, yeah. learn at, a little at bit. At the beginning, yeah. we start off at the library because that's yeah. really the safe place to establish that relationship. But once that's established, we have people that have been volunteers for years. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Welcoming people to their home is very special. Chris, I think you, I was reading an article uh, in which you were quoted, and I think you said some of your volunteers smother the refugees with so much love and attention. I think it, those were your words. It's a problem. <laughs> it's very powerful, that um, one. <laughs> right. The, 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 um, the overall goal of refugee resettlement, and it's partly the result of not having a lot of money to do it, the overall goal is to help refugees become as, se as self-sufficient as they can as soon as possible. Self-sufficient as soon as possible. We apply that same goal to refugees who are being resettled by a community group, even though the community group in West Hartford or Greenwich or Avon or Bloomfield or New London, even though that community group might have plenty of resources mm -hmm. to support that family for years, we say no. This family has been pushed around and persecuted, told what to do, where to go, where not to work for years. They need to regain control over mm -hmm. their lives. Mm -hmm. Help them do that, and the best way sometimes is to say no. Mm -hmm. No, you know, you can take the bus to the grocery mm -hmm. store, or you can walk. Um, you've got to take that job. Mm -hmm. I know that washing dishes is not your ideal dream job, but you can move on to something else, but you've got to take a job now because time is running out and you have to start covering your own rent. Mm -hmm. So we tell groups, help them only as long as they really need help. Mm -hmm. Give them that opportunity to control their own lives, to be self-sufficient. Amy, that reminds me of something that you were saying during your talk about how we talk about refugees, how we see them, and how we depict them to others. Um, and I think, you know, that ties in with what Chris was just saying, which is to give um, these people the feeling of being in control of their own lives, taking over, and living the way most people do. Absolutely. Um, so I'm the biggest advocate for the agency of refugees. I feel that um, the images that we see in the, in the news even, um, or even how we read about it historically, uh, makes them kind of quintessential victims, and they're so capable. They're so capable and they're so resilient. And I mean, the proof is in the fact that they made it here. Mm -hmm. And so once they're here, I think it becomes our prerogative, right, to be these community leaders um, and being community members to be a part of that village mm -hmm. that enables them to realize, I mean, even just talking, art, artistic expression, like I think that's wonderful. And there's so many different aspects of human expression and existence that we all have a stake in. So I, I definitely completely agree with Do we have other questions or comments? Go right here. Yes, sir. Thank you. I'm glad I was able to come to Hartford today. Um, I guess I'm indirectly connected with IRIS because I work with the Quiet Corner program up ah. in Northeastern Connecticut. You guys are great. And, and Thank been, you. Uh, you're welcome. And I've been volunteering. I'm volunteering with two different families right now 
helping them learn English and other things that I get assigned. And it's really a privilege to do that. Um, I guess my question is, is about Iris. Um, what do you see as the biggest needs, issues, problems, concerns at this time with respect to Iris meeting the needs of the population that are here already or you'd be beginning to serve? Mm -hmm. Well, um, so the executive orders attempted to reduce the number of refugees from 110,000 to 50,000. Along with that reduction would be a reduction in funding for refugee resettlement agencies. So our funding will be cut. Um, our supporters have promised to fill in that gap, and we're working on that now. Um, so the need really is beyond Iris's own um, agency needs. We do have needs, of course, but I'm thinking bigger picture. The need is for us to urge the government to return to that 110 thousand, or at least the 85,000, which was the number we brought in last year. There's no excuse for us not to do that. The courts have stopped those terrible executive orders. Refugees are allowed to come in. Funding for this fiscal year has been approved in an amount for refugee resettlement that we had last year, so we have funding to bring in 85,000. We have a legal structure that allows us to bring in 85,000. What is stopping us? And it's just uncertainty and uh, orders, maybe from our new Secretary of State. We have got to speak up, make some noise, and say, this country needs to bring more refugees because we're looking at the worst refugee crisis the world has seen since World War II. This is not the time when we should be reducing the number of refugees. So, so Chris, what do you say to people who say, if they come here, they'll take my job? Well, that's just not true. Uh, talk to employers. And I never, you know, I never go to an employer, let's say you're the manager of a restaurant, I never say, M move my refugee client to the front of the line. I just say, give them a chance. Interview them. Give him a shot in the kitchen, washing dishes for an hour, and then you just hire him if you think he'll be good. Employers love to hire refugees. They are hardworking, motivated. They have come to support their family, to build a future. And uh, the jobs that refugees go into are not high on the list of most people in this country. Hotel housekeeping, um, dishwashing in kitchens, uh, uncomfortable work in small factories, landscaping. Um, I don't see thousands of Americans born in this country lining up for those, for those jobs. Um, they, in fact, strengthen the economy. And in some towns and cities across the country, refu large refugee populations have actually saved those cities. They have kept them from economic decline. So they're, they're a real plus for the economy. Does anyone else have, have a question or a comment? Just, just follow up. Uh, sure. We've heard a lot recently about Australia and connections. Uh, you know, there was a, there was a uh, promise to bring in refu refugees. Oh, sorry, it's on. It's on. Uh, sorry. Uh, promise to bring in additional refugees through Australia. What does that do to the sum total? Um, so Australia has a, an awful uh, policy of uh, intercepting uh, refugees or asylum seekers in boats off the coast and then diverting them to these distant islands and keeping them in what have been described as like concentration camps by our own Save the Children uh, who visited these camps and reported on the conditions. We struck a deal with Australia uh, to bring some of those uh, more than... Um, thousand of those asylum seekers to the United States. Now they have to go through the vetting process. So they'll undergo that year and a half, two year vetting process, and then they would be incorporated in the 110,000 or whatever limit uh, our president sets. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was the deal that President Trump said was a really bad deal, 
it was uh, a uh, humanitarian offer to Australia. You've got this problem. It's your own creation. Um, nevertheless, we're going to help you out for the sake of these families. Any other questions or comments? We're almost out of time. Yeah. Sorry, it's about Australia. Um, Are you Australian? No. <laughs> But what's in it for Australia to take the uh, refugees and then place them somewhere else? Good question. And I'm not sure, um, although a visitor from Australia uh, visited our office a couple of weeks ago, and she heard that uh, this might actually be an exchange, that some uh, asylum seekers who have come to the United States might be offered a future in Australia. I don't know that for a fact, but it does seem a bit odd that uh, we're taking the refugees from Australia. What uh, are they, or what are we getting in return? I mean, there's nothing in this minefield. You have to have a meeting in the mines. And it just seems to me that there's like uh, something in there that's not quite Well, right. I'd like to give our government the benefit of the doubt and think that it was done for purely humanitarian reasons. How's that? I have time for one more question or comment, if anyone would like to, the gentleman in the back in the white shirt. Yeah, just a uh, quick general question. Maybe you know the answer to this, maybe not. But how does our vetting process compare to what the European Union is doing? Anything we can learn from what they're doing or what they're not doing? I think they can learn from us. Our vetting process is much tougher than any other government's vetting process. We have brought in over 100 over 800,000 refugees since the 9-11 attacks. 800,000 refugees through that vetting process. Two were convicted of planning terrorist activities. Two were convicted of trying to send guns back to the Middle East. Um, not a single American has been killed by a refugee who's passed through that process in a terrorist act in this country. Uh, Chris, you mentioned that um uh, your supporters have said they're going to make up for your uh, loss of funding. And I noted that uh, you, every February, I don't know why you do this, but you do a run for refugees in New Haven in February, which seems like a difficult time to be running through New Haven, but okay. Um, and apparently this year you raised more money than you have in the previous nine years combined. Yeah, it was a combination of great weather and a terrible executive order. Um, <laughs> And they all came together at roughly the same time. People wanted to do something to show their opposition to this executive order that was uh, um, hurting the refugee program. So they, what can I do? Well, I can run five kilometers in the dead of winter. Mm -hmm. uh, or I can walk it. Or I can at least show up in March. And that's true. The response was overwhelming. Again, Connecticut. Thank you, Connecticut. I just want to, uh, we have to wrap up now, and I just want to have each of you um, give us one short idea of what each of us watching the program today could do. Amy, I'll start yeah. with you. Yeah, well, um, I was very new to the issue of refugees, and obviously it was in kind of light of everything that was going on with the crisis that I wanted to get involved, and it's really just reaching out to not just organizations like IRIS, but these community organizations that have all this capacity building to be able to integrate people that need our help. And so, uh, you know, I would encourage people to start reaching out to these organizations, these institutions, and see what they can do because the, we need people. We need lots of people. It's not just a, a core group of leaders. Or it, we need everyone. Nancy, if people want to get involved in some of the Hartford Public Library programs, what do they do? Uh, they, they contact me um, at the library, Nancy Cadigan. Um, I have a, a flyer to pass out today. Uh, my telephone number is 860-695-6316. My plea would be to please welcome your neighbor. And I think since this uh, current administration, people, I would have double the volunteers calling and saying they too want to do something because they feel so helpless. Mm -hmm. And the demands of the immigrant and, and uh, refugee community have also increased because people aren't feeling safe. Mm -hmm. So we can really use all the help that we can get. Chris, I'll give you the last word. Right, funding, volunteers, furniture, community groups, all of that. Refugees need it all. Jump on our website, irisct.org. 
there are a whole range of things that you can help with. Thank you all three for being with us today. Really appreciate it. Thank you.